You are listening to a free audio recording of I Have a Bone to Pick with the Scientific Community, an essay that is part of my anthology titled For Your Consideration. If you enjoy this work and wish to read more pieces like it, then please consider supporting me by purchasing the ebook or paperback version available at the links below, where you will have access to almost two dozen more essays, including my defense of freedom of speech, my theories as to a life well lived, and other erratic ravings. If you cannot purchase my anthology, then follow the link to my channel where you will find other free readings, and be sure to leave a like and review. Thank you. Without further ado, I have a bone to pick with the scientific community. Not some insolent vendetta, mind you. Not some angry fist shaking at some scientist I disagree with. Not because of any fringe theories they refute or even my own occult interests, which they often deride. Nor is it a critique of the academic fandom, though they too play a part in this. This is not personal. But it must be said all the same. There are those among this crowd both the academics and their fans, who would claim that since I myself am not a scientist, then I shouldn't presume to speak on this matter, to which I respond that if we all kept silent about such things we were not masters of, then some people could only talk about one subject, and most couldn't talk about anything at all. Or I would just say that I'm not a helicopter pilot and yet I know it shouldn't land in a tree, whichever sounds more poetic by the end of this. With all that said, let it be known that I, too, am a fan of science. I consider myself an academic, in case you couldn't tell by my vast ego in publishing works entirely made up of my own opinions. I benefit from medicine and modern engineering. I enjoy my food cold. I like coffee whilst living outside of the coffee belt, and I am not forced to chisel this essay into limestone. All of these things are possible through scientific advancement. Great job, lads. My critique, then, is not over the profession itself. Not entirely. Rather, it is on the romantic mantle of those within it, and those who endorse it. Because, above all else, science rarely pays very well. Much like being a teacher, or a librarian, or a fireman, these kinds of cerebral professions, except the last one, sorry, himbos, are seen more as a point of virtue. They accept the low pay and long hours for the pursuit of truth and the protection of the community. In this, one could argue that the true wage of the academic is the trust the public puts in them. All one need do is disagree with an academic, or be called out by one, to become the subject of mockery and ridicule. This is why most any inane or silly action can be hand-waved as for research. It is why there is an influx of amateurs conducting social experiments to dodge accountability for their shitty behavior, and it is why many politicians often flank themselves with rows of scientists before giving any grand speech that affects public interest. People often trust academics, as they should. Because the academic fandom does have one thing right, in that between trusting an amateur or a professional, you ought to trust the professional. But this kind of wage leads to a type of elevation of status, where one is beyond disagreement, beyond criticism. Scientists and their ilk are often seen less as humans working a job and more as paragons of virtue and enlightenment, a living incarnation of absolute progress, which, no matter how positive, is still a measure of dehumanization. This, then, is the core of my critique, something that many members of the fandom, bureaucrats, and even celebrity scientists themselves often forget. They are just people. Not people of particular wisdom and virtue, though I'm sure some of them are. They are just people. Just as biased, just as arrogant, just as flawed as you or I. They are no more infallible, 
no more incorruptible than a professional in any other field, an expert in any other profession. Just as a judge tends to rule more harshly before lunch, and more leniently after, just as police officers have higher rates of domestic violence, just as the Vatican has historically covered up abuse, so too are academics just people. We often think of scientists as the ones leading the way, the ones carrying the blazing torch of truth to light our way in the dark, the mediatrope of the ignored expert, the lone person who knows the sky is falling and how to handle it whilst everyone else squabbles over petty issues, is almost always a scientist. Yet in history, the expert being ignored is often a victim, not to an ignorant public or an unwavering king, but of their own peers. John Snow often called the grandfather of epidemiology for his work in diagnosing the cause of cholera outbreaks in London, was himself a skeptic of miasma theory, the dominant medical theory at the time that disease was spread, as the name suggests, through a pungent miasma. He believed, as his research would eventually prove correct, that illnesses could be traced to specific contaminants, such as fecal matter in water, today recognized as the basis of germ theory. But most of his opponents to this bold, new theory were not the common man. John Snow was, indeed, a doctor. People trusted him when he told them to get their water from elsewhere. No, it was his own colleagues and those on the Health Commission who dismissed the grand portion of his findings, stating that it surely was a miasma hanging around the pump and the pump itself just being in an unfortunate location. It wasn't until much later, after Snow's report, circa 1854, was joined by numerous others, that germ theory was professionally considered by the end of the decade. The story of Ignaz Semmelweis is similar, who, in his efforts to reduce childbed fever, found that most deaths were caused when doctors performed surgeries and autopsies on one patient before going directly to another to assist in childbirth without sanitizing their hands or equipment. He became a proponent for hand-washing, a theory utterly rejected by his contemporaries, who would either twist his findings or simply dismiss him altogether, mocking his ideas in the press. He was ridiculed to such an extent that he developed a nervous depression, lashing out at his critics and peers and eventually being committed to an insane asylum where he died, weeks later, from an infection. Ironic. His death was passed over with little attention, and not even addressed by the association for which he dedicated his life's work. Even after his successor was appointed and death rates increased sixfold following the dismissal of his practices, there was neither inquiries nor protest from his peers. It was only twenty years following his death that his guidelines were put into common practice with the help of Louis Pasteur's cementing of germ theory. In modern psychology, it is theorized that many doctors and scientists of his day were especially rejective of his theory because, if they accepted it, it would mean that they were regularly killing their own patients. Indeed, his ideas were dismissed so absolutely that his very name became its own symptom, the Semmelweis reflex, referring to behavior characterized by a reflexive rejection of new knowledge because it contradicts with entrenched norms and traditions. It is counterintuitive to think so, but scientists are traditionalists by nature. Groundbreaking innovations and new discoveries are made not by the status quo, but of breakaway theories. Scientists, by instinct, are forced to toe a line. Their work is built off of previously set foundations, their studies entrenched in the evidence their forefathers found, as if knowledge grows like branches from the trunk of a tree, and if a branch is ingrown or gnarled, then it must be cut and tended so that a new theory springs forth from the same foundation, rather than each fact being a tree unto itself. Scientists of Snow's day didn't reject germ theory because they were angry at his dashing looks or because they really liked killing the poor, but because they were working off of previously endorsed and proven theories of the past. They believed, with all certainty, that they were correct. It was Jon Snow that was the crackpot. 
But of course, I am told, that this just happened in the old days. It's not like it is now where these discoveries are taken very seriously because we've learned from our past sins. But we haven't. The idea of plate tectonics was first developed by Alfred Wegener in 1912 and was not considered mainstream until 1966. Theories of behavioral economics were proposed as early as the 1700s, and yet were not considered model for business practice until 2002, mostly due to what I've been told, a reluctance to accept psychology as a true discipline. Bell's theorem, the idea that quantum physics predicted instant action at a distance, was first proposed by John Bell in 1964 and was largely dismissed by his academic fellows, including Albert Einstein himself, who mocked it as spooky action. It wasn't until 1972 when the experiment was even considered and performed by John Clauser and Stuart Friedman that it was actually proven significant. The discipline of experimental psychology was first categorized for academic research in 1879 by Wilhelm Wundt, or circa 1890s with psychoanalysis by Sigmund Freud, depending on who you ask. And yet even to this day, debate rages on about whether psychology is a quote-unquote true science deserving of respect or even consideration by its more hard science-oriented peers. We do not know what radical idea is being proposed today, but there is surely one, and it will be looked back on with shame and remorse that it was not discovered sooner, not for a lack of equipment or specialty, but simply for a lack of interest. A pure dismissal based on the fallacy of arguing from incredulity, that it sounds mad and so cannot be true. Let it be known that I am not encouraging instant acceptance of all fringe theories. Most of them are wrong, dead in the water. Replacing a man's entire nervous system with ground-up cereal is surely a fringe procedure, but that does not make it correct just because it's anti-mainstream like some kind of info-hazard hipster. What I am instead pointing out is that the sphere of academia, rather than being governed by some idealistic mix of progress and reason alone, is composed of human beings, with vested opinions, prejudices, and orthodoxies at no less a rate than any other sphere, be it political or religious. Make no mistake, science does have its heresies. James D. Watson is an American molecular biologist, geneticist, and zoologist whose claim to fame is the co-authorship of the academic paper that proposed the double helix structure of the DNA molecule. For this discovery, he, along with his co-researchers, were awarded a Nobel Prize. He went on to serve as director of Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory, abbreviated as CSHL, and succeeded in greatly expanding its level of funding and research, resulting in many breakthroughs in the study of cancer, along with making it a world-leading research center in molecular biology. For his many accomplishments and good works, he has been given numerous honors, including the Albert Lasker Award for Basic Medical Research, the membership of the National Academy of Sciences, the John J. Carty Award, being sworn in as a member of the Royal Society, gaining an EMBO membership, a Copley Medal, and a Lomonosov Gold Medal. Not that any of these matter anymore, because he also stated, off the record, that he is of the opinion that there is a genetic link between one's race and intelligence. Because of these unsubstantiated and reckless remarks, the lab he served for 40 years revoked all honors and awards they previously bestowed to him. He later reiterated his opinions in a PBS documentary, and the CSHL board was shocked to find that humiliating someone and forcing them into retirement didn't actually change their opinions, so they just severed all ties with him instead. Quote, Dr. Watson's statements are reprehensible, unsupported by science, and in no way represent the views of CSHL, its trustees, faculty, staff, or students. The laboratory condemns the misuse of science to justify prejudice. And, the statements he made in the PBS documentary are completely and utterly incompatible with our mission, values, and policies, and require the severing of any remaining vestiges of his involvement. 
Simons and Stillman said. To the credit of CSHL, they did say they appreciated his many decades of dedicated service, and it was purely a matter of his abhorrent opinions that they could no longer allow him his honors, which, to reiterate, had nothing to do with his personal views. Nor were they able to work with him after he spent the better part of his life improving their facilities and helping to study and treat cancer. How convenient. I wonder if they utilized the resources his administration provided with the same guilty looks as many scientists do today, knowing they're working off of Nazi research. You know, the same Nazi scientists who were given full clemency for all their crimes against humanity if they just came and worked for the good guys instead. <sighs> this kind of thing leaves a bad taste in my mouth. It's the same feeling I get when I read of yet another product, another universe, another IP based off of the works of H.P. Lovecraft, and in the same breadth they use to try to sell their product based off his works, they decry him and throw him into the muck for his unsavory social views. Because, as it happens, people are more than happy to poach and profit from your work, so long as they can grandstand about what a good person they are while they do it. James Watson went on to suffer financial troubles due to no longer being employable in his academic field, go figure, and was forced to auction off his hard-won Nobel Prize to make ends meet, along with the notes for his Nobel acceptance speech and the manuscript for the lecture that he gave the day after he received the medal. Though, in an act of supreme kindness and charity, the winner of this auction, Alisher Usmanov, returned the medal to Watson under the promise that a portion of the proceeds would go to further charities for cancer research. Regardless of your views on his idea of race and intelligence, it is still clear proof that there is both a political and social bias in the academic field, where holding unsavory views, even if they have nothing to do with your work, could still get you exiled and your work sullied. If you require yet more proof of political presence in academia, I would encourage you to ask Bruce Aylward, Senior Advisor to the World Health Organization, abbreviated as WHO, how he feels about Taiwan gaining WHO membership, and see how fast he hangs up on you like he did to RTHK reporter Yvonne Tong, insisting that they had already discussed China. <clears throat> For those of you not in the know... China considers Taiwan part of its sovereign territory. Taiwan disagrees. The WHO, too, regards Taiwan as part of Chinese territory and seems to refuse to acknowledge any cultural or political difference between them, much to the despair of the Taiwanese. This is the same WHO that agreed with Chinese health preliminary investigations that the coronavirus was non-transmissible from human to human. The WHO's seeming deference to China, its policies, and the frankly embarrassing amount of praise it lavishes on them has been heavily criticized since the start of the pandemic, and has led to a much greater degree of scrutiny over its motives for doing so. The German broadcasting station Deutsche Welle has interviewed experts who speculate that the vast amount of economic might China holds in its grasp may well be a tempting target to an organization that relies so heavily on donations and dues from member states all such cases seemingly suggesting that academic virtue might not always be at the forefront of their minds. On the opposing end, there are those I've related this story to, uh, the James Watson one, who told me that while they don't necessarily agree with the board's decision, still believe Watson wouldn't have been a good fit to stay in his profession anyways, since he could have been made biased by his views and influenced his findings thereby. But... I don't necessarily agree. I do not believe his opinions would influence his work in the same way that a chef not liking the taste of fish wouldn't necessitate their intentionally spoiling it when cooking it for others. Despite Watson's rather, um, odd views, his works doubtless went to furthering and bettering humanity as a whole, not only through his professional life, but also in charities he took part in and the signing of the Humanist Manifesto. He has always seemed well-meaning, even in his views on race, stating that he did not mean to give vent or fuel to racist ideas, and was simply trying to acknowledge what he saw as a fact. Furthermore, even if his views did color his work, wouldn't that just prove my point anyways? 
that an academic, no matter their honors and works, is still just a human being prone to human bias that can influence them for better or worse? Would that still not apply to everyone? Finally, suppose he had the opposite view. Suppose he viewed Africans as intellectually superior to Caucasians. Would that view, then, too, not be a form of influencing bias that could color his work in the opposite direction? Couldn't a scientist, even one with more socially acceptable opinions, still be influenced by them in a way that skews their work? Of course, we needn't bother asking these questions. There are entire branches and divisions of discovery considered a touchy by many members of the scientific community at large, including those revolving around differences of race, gender, and sexuality, because it would fuel bigoted supremacy groups, gene editing, because it would involve questions as to when it is okay to change someone to fit a specific end, even if beneficial, the ethics of robotics and when something should be treated as a person or as a tool, because of questions revolving around consciousness and what makes it special to be human, Greater studies into nature versus nurture, because if it seems nature is victorious, you could theoretically categorize humans by DNA alone, and studies as to the role culture plays in one's psyche and what that would mean for society at large. Sensitive topics also include more niche social categories that would otherwise cause civil unrest, such as studies into parenting, the regulation and long-term effects of generic drug and medication use, whether robots should replace workers, the damage and danger of advertisements and breaking news, the use of aborted fetuses to conduct medical research, the damage idealization does to one's psyche and its prevalence in media in the digital age, deep studies into religion and its practitioners, whether humans should be cloned at all, whether humans should be tested upon at all, whether or not organ donation should be mandatory, studies into factory farming, the utopian society and who is required to make it, and the use of nanotechnology, among many others. Even in attempting to write a research paper, you may be gently guided away from topics that could bring up controversy, or even more gently guided into finding things that bring the most cash benefit. It seems even the crowd that traditionally shouts to the moon about the importance of following truth wherever it goes and how it always prevails and can never be hidden for long still shy away from investigating when it makes them a bit uncomfortable in their ideology to do so. Though, to their credit, that's the same with most people who tout truth as an underlying foundation of their ideology, because the problem is that truth is impartial, and cares nothing for feelings, cohesion, or stability, and this makes it no friends among those who rather appreciate these things. Unfortunately, it seems the people we often trust most to find these truths are not impartial, and do have care and concern for the effects their discoveries will have on society at large, for better or worse. Which, I mean, fair enough, I suppose. I care about society too, and all things being equal, it is better to trust someone who is corruptible and knows what they're doing than someone who is corruptible and doesn't. But it is still important to make that distinction. It is still important to know that academia is corruptible, politicized, and biased, and that they are always able to bend the truth when it suits their ends. This is why I made the point earlier that the greatest wage of the scientist is the trust placed in their position, and that despite this dependence upon their expertise, we must always be vigilant, lest their position be abused to disastrous effect as it has been in the past. Andrew Wakefield was at one point a respected doctor and gastroenterologist at UCL Medical School, and he went on to cause the autism vaccine scare of 1998, which is still the foundation for the current anti-vax movement today. He pushed his own variant of the vaccine at greater cost to the buyer, as well as an autism testing kit of his own design, neither of which were functional because the autism-causing disease he claimed to discover was unable to be found by any of his peers. His cohorts, John O'Leary, professor at Trinity College, and Hugh Fudenberg, immunologist and former chairman at MUSC, both swore up and down as to Wakefield's testimony and that they actually did find this autism-causing disease from their samples. Completely unrelated, O'Leary had an 11.1% .1 stake in Wakefield's prospective company, which would have been selling the testing kits, and Fudenberg was listed on the patent as co-creator of the superior vaccines that Wakefield tried to pitch, both being worth potentially millions of dollars of sales, 
and we know that because that was their selling point to prospective investors. If you're interested in the full depth of this particular tale, I'd recommend Harris Brewis's incredible documentary, Vaccines and Autism, A Measured Response, about how the whole scare was started and the sheer depths people will go to for money and fame. You can find it here on YouTube. John Money was at one point a respected professor of pediatrics and medical psychology at Johns Hopkins Gender Identity Clinic, and in his pursuit of studies regarding sexology, gender identity, and sexual orientation, went on to mistreat and abuse two young boys, one of which, due to a botched circumcision, was raised as a girl at Money's insistence to test his theory as to gender being a social construct. To facilitate this, he had the victim's testicles removed, had all trace of the boy's original sex expunged as he was treated as a girl, given hormone treatments, and given a new name. To familiarize the victim with the quote-unquote female identity, he encouraged the two pre-adolescent boys to perform sex acts on each other, and would observe them undressing and performing quote genital inspections, unquote, which he took at least one photograph of, as described in the victim's biography written by John Colapinto. Though Money described the experiments as successful, the victim and his brother did not agree, with the victim never identifying as a woman and reassigning themselves male upon learning the truth of their sex. Didn't end up helping, though. Both boys ended up killing themselves, citing both the trauma, abuse, and lack of support as main culprits in their suicide. Patrick Moore was at one point a respected specialist in forest biology whose claim to fame was co-founding Greenpeace and bringing attention to the destructive testing of nuclear detonations by the American and French governments, as well as raising awareness and funding to protect whales from predatory fishing practices. Nowadays, after his split from Greenpeace, all he's famous for is consulting on behalf of corporations who rely upon fossil fuels and oil as main exports, and speaking in defense of companies like Monsanto, who did not disclose the cancer-causing carcinogens in their weed-killing products. Also that these same corporations can sound more environmentally friendly than they actually are, I presume. Harry Harlow was at one point a respected doctor specializing in the psychology of animal behavior at University of Wisconsin-Madison, whose work and research with rhesus monkeys and their attachment to surrogates paved the way to new findings of the importance of parental affection and guidance in a young child's life, which, up to this point, had largely been seen as wasteful and a sentimental effort. After the death of his second wife in her struggle with cancer, Harlow was said to have become a bitter, sadistic man, whose efforts shifted from the importance of love and maternal care to, seemingly, reveling in the joy of depriving animals of their mothers and playmates, leaving them in dark, cramped isolation chambers for up to a year in something he coined the Pit of Despair, strapping them to, um, <clears throat> rape racks, where he would entice vicious fornication from other members of the species whilst the victim could neither run nor fight back, and devising surrogates that tortured the rhesus monkey babies by spraying them with ice-cold water, hitting them across the room, or pricking them with sharp spikes. One of Harlow's former students, William Mason, wrote of the experience, quote, He kept the experiments going to the point where it was clear to many people that the work was really violating ordinary sensibilities, that anybody with respect for life or people would find this offensive. When inquired as to his treatment of the rhesus monkeys, Harlow responded, quote, The only thing I care about is whether the monkeys will turn out a property I can publish. For his efforts in studying a few monkeys and torturing many more, Harlow won a National Medal of Science based on his findings, in addition to being named the president of the American Psychological Association, which, as part of its duties, is meant to oversee ethical conduct in research, which, for some unfathomable reason, he was chosen as the most fit to do so. But, hey... At least he didn't say there was a link between DNA and intelligence, 
so he's obviously overqualified. Joseph Goldberger was at one point a highly respected, and still is actually, he's just dead now, doctor and epidemiologist who specialized in pandemics and outbreak diseases. He had a long and gold-spun history of rigorous and selfless service as he fought and caught diseases such as yellow fever, typhoid, dengue fever, and typhus. And he was the one who figured out that pellagra, a longtime enemy of the working-class American South, was an ailment born of a lack of nutrition rather than germs. He studied the diets common to orphanages and sanitariums, which was mostly corn-based, and arranged that they be given a lean, protein-heavy diet instead, not only finding that it prevented pellagra, but cured it. He went even further, supplementing his findings with experiments where he induced pellagra in prisoners via a protein-deficient diet in exchange for their pardons. The academic community at the time dismissed this finding, however, stating that it must have been latent germs instead. So, as a proper scientist, Goldberger threw a now infamous filth party, where he and select researchers, who volunteered, thankfully, tried to catch pellagra through very germ-infested means, including blood injections from those suffering from pellagra, contaminated tissue stuffed up their noses, contaminated throat swabs, and <clears throat> crafting a pill made from a mixture of feces, urine, and the scabs of the victims, which they then swallowed. Among all who attended, none caught pellagra through these methods. Not that it mattered. This, too, was dismissed by critics and peers, for this experiment involved mostly men, and of course everyone knew that women were more susceptible to the disease. Goldberger was having a rough time, because he was not up against just the disease, but also the Thomas McFadden Commission a group of doctors and researchers who found that there was no link between pellagra and diet, and that germs were the most probable cause. By complete coincidence, the Thompson-McFadden Commission was funded heavily by Southern Dominant Oil and Cotton Corporations, as reported by the National Library of Medicine. And to say that pellagra was caused by a nutrient-deficient diet was to say that Southern businesses didn't pay their workers a wage where they could afford healthy food. And how would they attract an influx of workers and business tourism then? It wasn't until 1916, after two years of fighting the commission, that Goldberger's findings were taken seriously, and he successfully campaigned to have brewer's yeast, which he found cured pellagra, though he knew not why, distributed by the Red Cross amongst care rations to those suffering from displacement and poverty. Make no mistake, Joseph Goldberger is a hero who risked his life time and again to help cure the diseases that have been haunting mankind for thousands of years. But in remembering his story, we must also remember the damage that the Semmelweis reflex can have, as most doctors of Goldberger's era were smitten with the idea that everything could be explained with germs, as well as the ever-looming threat of lobbying in academia to maintain preferred results over the truth. Santiago Genoves was an anthropologist affiliated with the National Autonomous University of Mexico, who experimented on the effects of isolation and close proximity by intentionally misleading ten volunteers into being trapped on a boat for 101 days in the Peace Raft slash Akali experiment, where he verbally and psychologically abused them with the intent of promoting either extreme lust or violence, up to and including their own death, the crew remained friendly and peaceful, even as Genoves allegedly repeatedly encouraged conflict, such as attempts to instill grudges by lying about what other passengers thought about another, mistreating one and favoring another, encouraging hazing, encouraging racist viewpoints, encouraging sexist viewpoints, and intentionally leaving knives and an axe out in the open to be used in any spontaneous rage. Luckily, by the end of the trip, when the crew was forced to commandeer the boat and sail it away from the danger Genoves sailed them into, the only person they ended up with a plan to kill was Genoves himself, in case he grew erratic and tried to sink the ship or something. Bharat Agarwal, formerly professor of cancer research at the MD Anderson Cancer Center, 
was struck from the board after it was found that he tampered with up to 65 of his research papers, showing a fraudulent link between specific chemical components and the curing of cancer, with the supposed motivation of promoting his own company selling alternative cures. Werner Bezwoda, formerly of the University of Witzwatersund, was dismissed after scientific misconduct in trials on the positive effects of bone marrow transplants on breast cancer, where he altered results to be overwhelmingly positive, motivated by, as far as anyone found, a distinct desire for fame. Joachim Bolt, an anesthesiologist based at the University of Gießen, was stripped of his professorship over charges of fabricating data in his research studies. To this day, many papers authored and co-authored by Bolt remain an open-source publication to be read by prospective surgeons, causing serious risk to all patients put under the care of his methods. C. David Bridges, a professor of biology at Purdue University, was found by an NIH investigation panel to have plagiarized from a colleague's manuscript he was asked to review, and falsifying records in an attempt to claim the discovery for himself. Chemist Annie Dukan of Hinton Laboratory, Massachusetts, had charges pressed over altering test results and adulterating samples in order to cover up misconduct, as well as giving the green light on untested drug samples, actions which resulted in the potential contamination of tens of thousands of drug kits and the potential wrongful criminal conviction of drug possession for anyone unfortunate enough to be tested by one. It is worth noting that, though she was only investigated in 2011, a probe by state police revealed that her superiors had been ignoring concerning behavior and red flags for potentially years. Daedric Staple, former professor of social psychology at Tilburg University and author-slash-co-author of the works Coping with Chaos, Selfishness of Carnivores, The Effects of Prime Awareness on Social Judgments, and From Unconscious Perception to Emotion, among others, fabricated data in dozens of studies on behavior found within said works. So if you read any of those, sorry about that. He even got a feature in the New York Times titled Audacious Academic Fraud, and has since had 58 of his publications retracted. On the grander scale of horrific events, after a staggering rough 107 papers on tumor biology had to be retracted, after editors found, quote, strong reason to believe that the peer review process was compromised, and an investigation was called into China's Ministry of Science and Technology over how this could be. This led to the discovery of a fraudulent peer review ring, where researchers would bolster each other up in order to get the green light and receive more funding from the years 2012 to 2016. A rough 510 separate cancer researchers were charged, most of whom were found guilty and the rest being put under observation. There is also the tragic story of Doris Stauffer, who, at 74, succumbed to Alzheimer's disease, which, by all medical accounts, she didn't carry the gene for. This was a startling revelation, because it means she might have mutated it, which would open up a whole new horizon into the disease and how it worked. Because of this, medical officials pleaded with her son, Jim Stauffer, to grant them rights over the body to perform research and find whether or not this was so, and Stauffer granted it. Her regular neurologist was not available, and so a nurse at the hospital recommended the Biological Resource Center, abbreviated as BRC in Phoenix, headed by Stephen Gore. Stauffer signed the agreement that his mother's brain would be used exclusively for Alzheimer's research and handed over the body whereupon, days later, he received a box from BRC containing her ashes with assurances that her brain would go on to save many lives. Three years later, a journalist uncovering cases of medical fraud found documents detailing that Mr. Stauffer was not, in fact, sent the ashes of his mother's body, but only of her hand, with the rest of her body, including the brain, being sold off for profit to a military complex to use in blast testing. The brain doctors begged to perform research on was never once touched by a scalpel.
BRC and military records show that at least 20 other bodies were also used in the blast experiments without permission of the donors or their relatives, and even the military itself seemed to have no knowledge of where these bodies were being sourced, relying upon falsified documents from the BRC itself. When BRC facilities were raided by the FBI, they allegedly found a, quote, Frankenstein-esque horror show, with potentially hundreds of bodies being placed haphazardly, hacked apart, and auctioned as requested, with almost none having proper identification or paperwork to go with their requested treatment. BRC, it seemed, was running a body-snatching ring, where they would request bodies of the recently deceased for research, only to turn and falsify documents in order to sell them to industrial complexes and organ harvesters for profit, and was doing so for over a decade, with thousands of bodies being misplaced in the process, as reported by Routers. It is worth noting that Stephen Gore, the director of this body-snatching ring, not only had zero credentials as to actually authorize the taking and storing of these bodies for their stated use, but never even went to college. He was able to deceive people, not out of true academic knowledge, but through the appearance of academia alone, the trust so imbued. And, of course, the sugar conspiracy, in which, during the formulative years of nutrition science in 1943, select food companies formed a board referred to as the Sugar Research Foundation, abbreviated as SRF, with the stated goal of, quote, dedication to the scientific study of sugar's role in food, unquote. The SRF managed this by sponsoring and funding Harvard researchers who published articles that downplayed the link between sugar and heart disease and overinflated research that found fat as the culprit. The reviews were published in the New England Journal of Medicine in 1967, with no disclosure of backing by the SRF. Kristen Kearns, Laura Schmidt, and Stanton Glantz, the three who have gone on to review the SRF's conclusions in their article for JAMA Internal Medicine, find no evidence that any research was directly tampered with. But they did discover documents promising the Harvard researchers that payments of what amounts to 50,000 US dollars would be provided for each successful article showing a greater link between fat and heart disease, or for efforts to discredit articles that linked it with sugar instead, promises which were never disclosed to the board, as reported by Stat News. Marion Nessel, a nutrition expert at New York University, is even more pessimistic with her own findings in JAMA Internal Medicine. Quote, in 2015, the New York Times obtained emails revealing Coca-Cola's cozy relationships with sponsored researchers who were conducting studies aimed at minimizing the effects of sugary drinks on obesity. Even more recently, the Associated Press obtained emails showing how a candy trade association funded and influenced studies to show that children who eat sweets have healthier body weights than those who do not. This was a battle also fought by John Yudkin, physiologist and nutritionist, as well as founding professor of the Department of Nutrition at Queen Elizabeth College, which culminated in his flagship work, Pure, White, and Deadly, in 1972, a summarization of all research correlating sugars, fructose, and glucose with obesity and heart disease. It was a battle he regrettably seemed to lose, as a mix of lobbying, strong-arming, and pure dismissal from his fellows prevented the work from being taken seriously, only being accepted in the early 2000s, and only gaining true traction in the 2010s. Sorry for all those butchered pronunciations, by the way. Despite what this list might imply, note that I am only bringing them up as an example to my point that academia is corruptible. In reality, most cases of misconduct within the scientific community affect only the scientific community. Plagiarism or theft of work are among the most common offenses, with Danielle Finelli's article, How Many Scientists Fabricate and Falsify Research, finding only 2% of scientists falsifying, fabricating, 
or modifying data in 33 engaging in questionable research practices, though it is worth noting that these are just those who admitted to doing so. It is funny, then, that where experts are concerned, reminding people that human beings have the capacity to lie and be susceptible to internal bias, is the act of a radical. This is only corruption that has been proven, by the way. It is to say nothing of suspicious behaviors, seemingly clashing interests, or prospective underhanded dealings like Catherine Ellen Foley's fabulous reporting in her Quartz article, Trust Issues Deepen, where she points out that nine out of the last ten FDA commissioners for the last 38 years at the time the article was written have gone on to work in the pharmaceutical industry as board members, directors, and presidents. Very cushy positions indeed. Or Ben Goldacre, fellow at the Institute of Psychiatry in London, among his many other awards, who has seemingly made it his life's mission to call out bad science, whether it be quackery, pseudoscience, or more alarming issues like what he notes in his TED Talk, What Doctors Don't Know About the Drugs They Prescribe, how a rough half of all drug trials are not made publicly available, so that risky and dangerous practices take longer to be found, and positive findings are twice as likely to be published as negative ones, giving undue incentive. Or Charles Pillar in GIU's article, Hidden Conflicts, where they detail investigations showing how, among other things, FDA advisors were paid anywhere from tens of thousands and in some cases up to a million dollars, by select pharmaceutical companies after giving their prospective drug a green light, a clear conflict of interest that, by and large, goes unreported and unconsidered. Or how, since the 1970s, a rough 50% of publishing in science has been under the domain of just five companies, Sage, Taylor & Francis, Springer, Elsevier, and Wiley Blackwell, with most of them not having the most respectable history as far as peer academia is concerned. Or victim M. Toledo's report on the corruption of science on an international level, along with the Union of Concerned Scientists report, Heads They Win, Tails We Lose, which details the methods of abuse and coercion that many corporations use to get results they desire from research reports. I reiterate, above all else, that I am not trying to promote an anti-scientific method form of thinking, nor am I trying to demonize academics or portray them as power-hungry or foolish. I am only trying to prove that some of them are. That much like with some general practitioners who do not even test for your ailments and just insist you're faking it, or with some teachers who ignore the problems of bullying, or with some fire stations who have an unfortunate history of employing hero-complex arsonists who set the fire themselves in order to have the glory of putting it out, that perhaps we should recognize that virtue is a quality of character and not profession. So you can see why it makes me a little nervous when I see opinion pieces that suggest academics should use their positions of trust and expertise to urge for certain social, political, or economic policies, especially because we have historical precedents for why that is a bad idea when, circa 1940, tobacco companies use doctors and their image to push the legitimacy of their claims between smoking and health. Despite this, and despite all the harm it can do, many lobbyists still try to push these views through academia anyways, as if any word that came from a scientist were a divine gospel to which it was heresy to question. A view I'm sure you realize how many corrupt corporations and researchers can take advantage of today. In such an environment where the opinion of one person bolstered by the media, can radically shift society and beliefs for years to come, and in an industry where even those with the best of intentions can err, where medical malpractice and error alone contributes to the third leading cause of death in America as reported by Johns Hopkins, it is not only unethical, but harmful 
to suggest that academics are above scrutiny. If detective novels have taught me anything, it's that the person you should be most suspicious of is the last person to see the victim alive, not because they're the most likely suspect, but because they are the only facet from which information about the circumstances flows without being able to be contradicted or critically examined by another. Nobody, neither mortal or divine, individual or group, is ever above scrutiny, and those trying to convince you they are do not have your best interests at heart. Some people will look at all this and argue that separate facilities and universities could become corrupt, sure, and that's why it's best to look at universal consensus, to which I would remind them that if the truth were closer to consensus, it would mean babies couldn't feel pain up to the late 1980s, and thalidomide was fine for pregnant women. Because, hey, I hate to break it to you, but all of the above scrutinies were just times where researchers were trying to hide what they were doing wrong. We haven't even gotten to issues plaguing modern science by sheer dint of accident and circumstance, through no fault of the faculty's own. Vox's article, The Seven Biggest Problems Facing Science, covers a paltry handful. Like how most money in academia is gained through the publishing of research papers which cause a feedback loop of quantity over quality or the publishing houses themselves and how they incentivize bigger, bolder discoveries over smaller, meaningful ones, pushing academics to alter their work, even down to the language used so that discoveries seem more groundbreaking and impressive than they actually are, or the lack of replication due to stronger incentives to focus on finding new information over checking old kinds, bungled peer review due to numerous issues, including a lack of reward for actually checking your peers' work, a lack of specialists who can review your work reliably, and researchers prioritizing their own investigations before reviewing others, as well as scientists being either legally or financially obligated to put their work behind paywalls, causing other researchers and reviewers to have to pay out of pocket to have the supplemental material, which in turn incentivizes them to charge for their own research to recoup the costs. As well as the clickbait nature that publishers will use to describe discoveries, using the most positive words such as cure for cancer, or negative wording such as die to death, in order to generate a higher view count and completely misrepresent the research, and honestly, just the crummy lives of many of these researchers in general, who are treated more as if they are contractors given grueling hours and paid very little for their services relative to how much they ought to be paid for their level of education. For yes, scientists are people. I believe I may have said that once or twice, who knows, and yes, I have been pointing out flaws in the field of academia for the whole of this essay, but these flaws stem from their humanity. For all the good and the bad it entails, they are people, and they are just as deserving of sympathy and support as you or I, and perhaps, if they got a little bit more of it, they wouldn't be suffering from depression and suicide to the point of climbing the list on every chart crossing profession with poor mental health. I've heard real science being described as having the willingness to change with new evidence, a ruthless peer review, inviting criticism, repeatable results, and taking into account all new discoveries. But of course, as we've just learned, this isn't true. There is rarely a willingness to change even with new evidence. The lack of proper peer review is one of the greatest insider threats in academia. Many celebrity scientists are antagonistic to their critics, and most experiments are so specialized that only a fraction of results are repeatable. The idea of this true science, this venerable, idealistic image of the perfect being, a doctor, Dutch name, McScientist, who is absolute in his reasonings, character, and information, from which all new discoveries descend, is little more than a fairy tale. Throughout all of this, everything we just discussed, the one biggest takeaway should be what I've been trying to instill this entire time, that scientists are just people, for all the good and the bad, for all the hope and despair, for all the bias and virtue, for all the benevolence in trying to do the right thing and the selfishness of corruption. 
they have been and always will be just people populated by you and I and your neighbor and that one office worker you really don't like and that boss who chose his nephew over you when you totally deserve that promotion more and that cute busybody at the grocery store who always smiles when they rack your things. They are just people. So the next time some big discovery is made, ask them if they're really extra super sure about the findings of their studies, and then cut them some slack if they tell you they don't know. And if you happen to be an academic and have gotten through this entire essay instead of passing it off as the ramblings of some anti-science nutcase, fantastic, I applaud you, you are my favorite kind of person, and this conclusion is for you. If you or any of your peers are aware of strange goings-ons, or are worried that someone has been altering their research, or even if you just feel nervous that what you might be doing may not be the most ethical, never ever be afraid to speak up. Even going outside of your field and contacting a journalist, most of whom would be happy to perform their own independent investigation and leave you completely out of it. If you are suffering from depression and anxiety, talk to someone. Talk to your friends. Talk to your loved ones. Talk to those who will understand you and accept your worries with all the grace and dignity they deserve. If you are concerned with the state of academia and where your profession may be going and the opportunities available to you, seek out circles with similar concerns. Contact unions. There are hundreds of people who would love to hear from you to be able to help you where you need it most. Being caught in these kinds of things can suck. But taking proactive steps to try to correct it and ferret out the truth and make sure all is as it should be is worth it. And together, between holding academia responsible for its screw-ups and raising awareness for the struggles and problems within, we can both, all of us, one by one, mend the problems that prevent us from moving forward to where we should be. And isn't that the job of a scientist, too? This has been a free audio recording of I Have a Bone to Pick with a Scientific Community, an essay neatly tucked away in my anthology titled For Your Consideration. If you enjoyed these mad ramblings and wish to read more pieces like it, then you will be pleased to know that you can by purchasing the ebook or paperback version available at the links below, where you will enjoy almost two dozen more essays, including advice on romance, what makes a hero, and one large rant about an anime character I don't really like. But if you've already spent your treat money for this month, don't worry, I forgive you. And you can still pop down to my channel where you can see the rest of whatever I'm willing to upload. Until next time.